All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lipp, director of the Big Apple Film Festival. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you for joining our podcast today. We are here today with our guest, Susanna Styron. Thank you, Susanna, for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Susanna is a seasoned uh, filmmaker uh, with an incredible um, background in, in writing uh, as well as directing. Her debut feature film, Shadrock, uh, was produced uh, for Sony Pictures um, and is currently available to stream. Um, she uh, also recently had a documentary um, titled Out of My Head, which won the uh, Best International Documentary Award at the Melbourne Film Festival uh, and was distributed by Kino Lorber. Um, and um, her current film, uh, My Father's Name, is going to be screening at the, uh, the upcoming Big Apple Film Festival. And as you say, Susanna also has an extensive writing background. Uh, she has written for Borgia for Netflix, um, 100 Center Street as well as a series of Hallmark films and, and, and many others. So, Susanna, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, so let's begin. I want to speak a little bit about creating personal films. And, uh, and, and I think a perfect example of this is the film you're going to be screening with us, My Father's Name, um, which is a, a, a very personal, very touching story um, uh, about a woman who discovers that her deceased father was involved with a lynching uh, many years ago. Um, and uh, it's quite a sensitive topic and, um, and quite courageous, you know, to, to share. Uh, so, Susanna, let me ask you, uh, what was it like creating a project like this, such a personal, uh, you know, story? Um, well, it was very interesting and very moving. First of all, it's not my personal story. It yep. wasn't my father. Right. Although it's called my father's name because <laughs> it's so much her voice and it's about her father. So the idea of a first person title sort of felt right. Um, it was a very intimate process because the subject, the, the woman who it's about, Jan Frazier, um, was, I mean, she never, she didn't set out to have a film made about her. I just heard about her story and I was so captivated by it that I contacted her. And she's, she lives in a log cabin in Vermont. I mean, she's not particularly gregarious. She doesn't draw attention to herself. But this subject was so important to her. And she was willing to do anything to talk about what the, journey put her through, particularly in terms of facing what she discovered to be her own unconscious racism. She began, when she learned this about her father, began to investigate it, it really made her investigate herself as well and her history and her whiteness and her relationship to black people through her life. And, how, and sorry, how did you first um, fi find out specifically about Jan, and then how did you end up meeting each other? You know, I was um, trying to make a film, a documentary, about this f woman in Florida who was sort of an unsung hero of the women's movement, and she was a civil rights activist. And she was from the town that the lynching took place in. And it was said of her that... Um, she witnessed that particular lynching as a child of 10, and it's what made her want to become a, an activist because she was so horrified by it. That was written about in her obituary, and when Jan was researching the lynching itself and trying to find out everything she could about her father and his participation, she came across this woman's name, Roxy Bolton, and um, tracked down Roxy's son, and Roxy directed her to me, I mean, Roxy's son directed her to me because he didn't know about it, but he knew I was making a documentary about her. So she contacted me to see if I had any information for her, which I didn't. I, had no, I, knew, I knew about the lynching. I knew that Roxy had, had, had been there, but she never spoke about it herself. She buried it, as people did. And so I couldn't get any, Roxy had already died, so when I was make, trying to make this film, which, which never finally got made, um, nobody I talked to knew anything about it. Um, but I was so captivated by Jan's story that I, you know, began conversing with her. And it was actually during the, it was right during lockdown. It was April of 2020 when she first contacted me. So we started with a Zoom interview and um which i recorded i was like is there a film here and so i recorded a zoom interview and then i started you know i was 
stuck at home we doing you know yeah. <laughs> doing whatever I could do at home and um so I started editing it a little bit. I started, you know, getting some archival footage from the internet and just trying it out. And I, and the more I talked to her, the more I realized there was a, a really big story here because, I mean, I had been drawn originally to the idea of how, wh what happens when you find out that somebody you love so much did something so horrible? How do you live with that? How do you reconcile that? I think that's very universal. I think a lot of people have that happen in their lives. And it just, and it, and it touched me. And also my, uh, my father's from the South and, um, you know, and, and actually hit my ancestors were slave owners. As most white people from the South, that, that, that's the case. I mean, I don't know about most, but a great deal of white families from the South were slave owners because that's what white people did. Um, so, you know, it touched me on many levels. Um, so, but what was fascinating about it was the, was her evolution and mine in the process of making the film. Um, because I began to examine what she was examining. And the first thing I did was I realized, there, okay, there's, there's something problematic here, which is she's a white person and I'm a white person. And it is her story, but it's about the atrocities that white people perpetrated on black people. And obviously it's a very volatile subject, especially now in our society. And it's a very important one. And it's one that is for the most part, ignored because it makes people so uncomfortable. You know, we're not like Germany where where school children are taught about the Holocaust because German people take responsibility for that um, history. We do the opposite here. You know, we don't teach. I mean, look at what's happening in the schools in the South, you know. Don't even teach about slavery. Anyway, so... Um, uh, the first thing I did was to bring on a black executive producer. And when I began editing, I hired a black editor because I felt that was really important to, you know, open my eyes too and to, and to find my bl blind spots, which, which happened and was a, was a fascinating process. And with Jan, for instance, she first told me that the, okay, the center of the story is this white storekeeper was murdered in Duck Hill, Mississippi. Two black men were arrested for the murder. And before they could even be tried, they were taken from the courthouse by an angry white lynch mob and they were lynched. It was an iconic, uh, it, was a, it was very important lynching historically um, and well known um, because there were photographs taken of it, which were the first photographs um, of a lynching ever to be published nationally. And they were published in Time Magazine and Life Magazine because there was an anti-lynching bill being debated in the Senate at that point, at that moment. <clears throat> um, so she told me that what was in the newspapers, she, she reported to me, as she had read, that two black men had murdered this white man who was actually a member of her family, the Fra Jan Frazier's family, uh, my subject's family. So that was why it was like a revenge killing, the lynching. Um, so I was, but they didn't, you know, so these two black men were arrested. She gave me the materials, the original newspaper reporting, and I read the materials and I went okay wait a minute Th this says there were no witnesses how do they know they were black men how do they know there were two how do they know they were men how do they know they were black like they didn't know anything there were no witnesses and I said that to her and she went oh my god I just always believed that because that's what my uncle told me um, when he told her the story about her father being involved in it so then she had to rethink her assumptions. She also um, 
in our original interview, was trying to justify her uncle when he told her that about their family's involvement in the lynching said to her justice was done and I mean this was horrifying to her that her uncle who she also loved and was sort of the last connection to her no longer alive father would feel this way so that was you know very hard for her to cope with and so she made excuses she said well you know it was this he grew up in the south in that time and that was what he was taught to believe and when I did a second interview with her, I kind of pressed her on it, and I said, you know, with all due respect, do you really think that that's an excuse? You know, are you letting them off? The, or how do you feel about that now? And she rethought it, and she realized, you know, I'm letting my family off the hook, and we can't, we can't keep doing that. So for both of us, it was this very fascinating process of it was an evolution. Yeah. I wonder if um, subconsciously or perhaps even consciously, if you were drawn to the story because of your own family history from the South that you mentioned, was there, did you recognize, was that sort of one of the reasons why you were drawn to it? I, I did, yes, I'm sure that was, but that was secondary. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, it was more unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly a world I've, I've lived in and thought about is that you know the history of of racism and particularly in the South mm -hmm. um, that I kind of grew up with, um, but f I I you know I make films I end up making films about really what what I think are really important issues, but my entry point is always the personal story. Mm -hmm. um and 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 that's that's what i was drawn to first was the how do you hold love and hate at the same time how do you hold good and evil at the same time how do we as human beings yeah do that i mean you have to because they both exist and um and it was only once we started exploring farther that i you know, I, I realized obviously that can't exist independent of its context, which is the history of racism and lynching. And yeah, that's yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, um, you know, grappling with love and hate because I think, <laughs> you know, in families, this is such a common issue. I think that people deal with. You know, you, you have such people have, uh, often within families, you have anger towards someone, but you lo you love the person, they are fa family members. So it's like, it, it, it is a very interesting conflict and, and very interesting to explore that. Yeah, and um, it's very alive right now because our politics are so polarized. Yeah. And you've got, I was just listening to NPR uh, coming here uh, about a couple where, you know, one's a Trump voter, one's a Harris voter, and they're a couple and they yeah. love each other. And, but like how how do you do that <laughs> yeah it's interesting yeah. uh you know one of the things you mentioned was um about it being a universally relatable in the sense that um you know everybody f uh or perhaps most people um f do find out things about family members um that you know they didn't know before that's something that is they, they can't believe like oh i can't believe that was my father or my grandmother or, or whoever and we have things in our families that we find out about people that we never knew and it's really kind of surprising um and so it, it's i think it's great that you're you made a, a a story that is yes it's specific to one person and one person's situation but it's also relatable um, universally, because everyone can say, yeah, well, my family, we didn't, we didn't have this happen necessarily, but, you know, my whoever was involved in something else. Um, mm -hmm. So what I, you know, I'm curious, when you look for a personal story of someone's, do you also think about, is this relatable for others, even if they haven't gone through a similar experience, but is it, do you think about that? Like when you, when you determine which kind of film you're going to make? Yeah, I mean, first of all, with documentaries, I never look for it. Mm. Every every documentary I've made, it's it's just come and like grab me by the throat. Yeah. <laughs> I have to make it, and it usually mm -hmm. starts with the personal, but it 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 needs to have a universal 
context yeah. Yeah. yeah and 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 you know and they they just they all have um with narrative with fiction yes i i i i either start with a personal story but context find the con the, the greater context the greater social political whatever it may be context or sometimes with with narrative i'll have an issue i want to explore and then i have to create a character who can embody that within a personal story and mm -hmm. sort of carry that carry that issue within their personal experience yeah have you, have you considered i mean it's such an interest jan's story is so interesting have you ever considered uh taking the, this con this documentary and maybe turning it into a narrative film as well? Is, is that something that you would ever consider doing? No, I wouldn't. I mean, I think it would make a great one. Yeah. But I, I've i done what I wanted to do with this subject. Yeah. You know, usually by the time I finish a film, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move on to something else. Right. Um, and, you know, to be honest, the subject matter is a difficult place to live and I lived within it for um, a long time and I ended up finishing the editing myself so I was really deep in it and it's beautiful it's not I mean it's tough to watch but it's also beautiful and moving um, and compelling to watch because it's very cinematic as well with what what you know what we did with particularly with the motion graphics and animation that's in it and um, I think it's it's riveting to watch, um, but it's you know it's painful subject matter, and right. I sort of I've spent enough time there now, right, for right. now. <laughs> now you've had experience in narrative and documentaries, right? Like mm -hmm. so, you began your your debut feature Shad Rock, which starred Harvey Keitel and Andy McDowell uh, for Sony Pictures, uh, and then of course. You know, you've done documentaries, Out of My Head, which we just mentioned, distributed by Kino Lorber, uh, and now your new film, uh, My Father's Name. Uh, you've written for Netflix, as we mentioned. Um, do you have a preference, documentary versus narrative, or is it more uh, specific to the project? Um, when I finish a documentary, my preference is narrative. When I finish narrative, my preference is documentary. Yeah. So you know, it just goes back and forth. I'm yeah. I'm I'm really um, nourished by each one in a different way, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So it's hard to it's hard to say, and it it really depends on the story that's being told too, whether it demands documentary or or narrative. Right. Right. And now, so you're. Uh, your other documentary, um, Out of My Head. So how does that differ from this current film, uh, My Father's Name? Well, that's really interesting because that also that was a completely personal entry point. Mm -hmm. And that was personal of, to my story. So that is about, that. that's a feature documentary, and it's about migraine disease, migra the neurological disorder, migraine, which isn't just a bad headache. It's very misunderstood. I mean, a lot of people can think of it as that. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a full-body neurological disorder. Um, the way I got into it is that my daughter, when she was, my oldest daughter, when she was 14 years old, she had a bout of temporary blindness. She, she came to me and she couldn't see. And I freaked out. <laughs> Then it passed. It only lasted about 10 minutes, and then she was okay, and she was dizzy, and then she threw up, and then she was fine. So I thought, like, oh, you know, she's going through puberty. All these things are happening to her body. It's fine. Happened again a month later, and then I um, I got her an, an emergency appointment with an ophthalmologist, and he looked in her eyes, and he said, oh, she's got um, – it's migraine. And I went, what are you talking about migraine? She doesn't have a headache. And he said, trust me. And he sent us to a neurologist. And she was diagnosed with migraine. And because it, that, I mean, th those are manifestations of migraine too, some of the sensory manifestations. After a while, she started having the headaches as well. And, um, and, and then she started having them um, once a month, and she couldn't, you know, get out of bed, and she was miserable, and I didn't know what was happening to her. And so I 
you know, I, we've, we got her treatment, and I started talking about it to my friends. My daughter has migraines, and it's so terrible, and we don't know what to do, and I'm so scared. <clears throat> and then I realized that all of these, you know, I would talk to people, and they'd say, oh, I get migraines too. Oh, I get, and I was like, why don't I know this about you if you're my friend? Why don't people talk about it? And I realized it was really a closet disease that people were ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And nobody had made a documentary about it. And I just, I and my, my producing partner, Jackie Oaks, who, we had made a documentary together called 912, um, which was about the volunteer community at Ground Zero, mm -hmm. which was also personal because I volunteered at Ground Zero. And that was sort of how we got into that. And she lived at Ground Zero. She, she had been evacuated. So yeah. I talked to her about this and her she had family members who had migraine. Neither of us had experienced it, but it had come it had hit very close to home for both of us. So we decided to make a documentary about it. We did a lot of research and we found all these fascinating things about it, like, you know, the hallucinations and that like Lewis Carroll had migraines and that Alice in Wonderland was based on his migraine experiences. Oh, really? I didn't and, know that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> fascinating. And um, yeah, yeah, you need to yeah. see the film and you'll you'll see. It's yeah. really, I mean, as, as sort of grim as the subject of migraine seems to be also, it's actually the film is very entertaining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's also fantastic animation in that. So I... I don't like to be in front of the camera, and I had no intention of making a film about my experience, but I, I, I interviewed my daughter sort of objectively like she was a migraine sufferer. Yeah. Um, but in the editing process, I, I couldn't quite find the arc of the story. You know, how do you, how do you hold together all of this scientific information and make a personal a story out of it that people are going to get invested in because you got to get emotionally invested in the subject or the subject matter of the film so um and then I realized at a certain point in editing that I had to kind of admit that she was my daughter and that this was a personal story so then I I brought myself into the film and made sort of the spine of the film um our personal story of trying to figure out what was wrong with her and how to help her mm -hmm. but I didn't want to be on camera so I I am in it as an animated character oh. my voice is in it uh -huh. but I'm never on camera oh, that's and an my, interesting way to yeah, portray yourself on yeah film. so you see my daughter and she's on camera live action and then she says something about me and then she turns animated and then I come into it animated Okay. Yeah, and our voices continue, and it go for her. It goes back and forth between live action and animation. Yeah. Wow. Very so cool. that was a really personal story that I needed. I, I I I wanted to get out in the world because I saw so much suffering and so much isolation because people weren't talking about it mm -hmm. and were suffering like hiding. That I really wanted to um, clarify it and bring it out into the world. Yeah, now that uh, that film it it screened at um, the Melbourne International Film Festival where it won Best Documentary. Yeah. Um, now, did it? Um, did you? Uh, did Kino Lorber purchase or acquire the rights to the film then, or was it? Uh, or was it um, had it already been? Distributed no, at that point? I think yeah. No, I think they <laughs> did afterwards. But we um, we premiered in the Museum of Modern Art in there. Oh, at um, the MoMA, yeah, Fortnite. We, yeah, yeah, at right, Doc right. Fortnite. And then we, um, we, what we wanted to do was have a good festival run before we um, looked for distribution. I mean, mm -hmm. you always look for distribution at yeah. the same time, you're hoping. But, um, you know, to be honest, I can't remember when Kino came in, but they were not our distributor yet. We didn't have distribution when we went to Melbourne. Yeah, I'm asking because you know uh, most of our viewers are you know filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers, and you know one of the big questions is distribution. Um, yeah. Certainly, a, a documentary on migraines um, in your current docu uh, documentary, uh, my father's name. You know, th there's an audience for for films like this. Um, do distributors generally come to you when you create a 
documentary or do you normally have to see, go to a film market or something like that and seek out distribution? I mean, my experience has been of seeking out distribution. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you win the – well, I was going to say if you win the jury award at Sundance, Sundance yeah. you get distributors. But that didn't happen this year with – the most be one of the most beautiful documentaries I've ever seen, which one called Porcelain War, which one best? Oh, nobody, which one, nobody picked up Porcelain War. Not from Sundance. Oh. They finally they have distribution now, but okay. it took it, it took a while. It's, I mean, it's really yeah. rough out there right now. It's really yeah. rough. Um, and short documentaries even rougher. I mean, I haven't even the the thing about this uh, about my father's name is. It's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be incredibly valuable for educational distribution. It's a, it's a conversation starter. Yeah. This is what I want to happen. I want it to go to schools. I want it to go to churches. I want to go to community groups. Um, we had a, an incredible panel discussion. We had a sold out screening at the Martha's Vineyard Film Center, a, a, a big movie theater on Martha's Vineyard. And a panel afterwards with Henry Louis Gates and Charlene Hunter Galt and a local rabbi and me. And it was a fascinating conversation. And the, the audience was just riveted. And we had such a great Q&A. And it was a mixed race audience. And um, it was so affirming of what conversations this can start. And I think, you know, it's important for for filmmakers to think about what's the impact you really want to have with this. I mean, yeah, it's great to have glitzy stuff and get a lot of publicity and yeah. have it on television or mm -hmm. whatever your goals are. But really, it's how can you best reach the people who will benefit most from seeing your film? How can your film, I mean, if it's an issue film, how can your film make the most difference in the world? Yeah. And that is often by reaching people in universities or in high schools or in, in you know, in, in local mm -hmm. groups. So in presenting a film like this, do you <clears throat> prefer to have a public showing where you have a room full of people and you can actually have a panel after? I mean, do you you prefer that rather than, you know, seeing it on a streaming platform? Um, is that, I you... mean, as a filmmaker, I always prefer my films, no matter how small, be seen in a movie theater. Yeah. You know, it's just... It's just the way films are meant to be seen. <laughs> right. And with an audience, you know, it's great. See, I've, we've, we've had a lot of screenings now, and it's so great to watch it with an audience. It looks great on a big screen. Yeah. And the Q&As afterwards have been fascinating. I mean, it really makes people think and feel, and we have these fascinating conversations. So, yes, it's more, it's more gratifying as a filmmaker to be present at a screening. Yeah. It's, uh, it, you know, it makes me happy to know people see it on a big screen, but you don't reach very many people that way. Right. So I, you know, I, I want everything to be on a streaming platform because that's how people watch it. I don't really want people to watch it on their phones, but if they, yeah. if that's the only way they're going to watch it, I'd rather that yeah. than nothing. Yeah. I watch everything I watch. If, you know, if I'm streaming and it's not on a streaming platform that's that, that you know that's on my TV, um, I broadcast it to my TV so I can see it big, just right? Because I like seeing it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. It's you know somebody had asked me once, you know, uh, this was a while ago. Oh, with all the streaming platforms coming out and all the content on streaming, do you think film festivals will still be around eventually? And I said yes because you're talking about two very different things. Even they're both, even though they're both presenting films. The purpose of a film festival is a communal experience. It's bringing people together. It's a conversation. It's networking. It's interacting. Where streaming, it's specifically just to watch that particular movie. Right. 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 Um, yeah. Film festivals are so great and are so important and are and are so much fun. Yeah. I mean, there. It's really important. I mean, make some. Filmmaking can be incredibly collaborative. I mean, it is incredibly collaborative. But when you're making a small, low-budget documentary, it can be, get pretty isolated, especially if, like me, you're editing it yourself or you're working with one or two people. Um, going to a film festival, you get you not only get to have your film shown communally, you get to meet other filmmakers. You get to see other films. It's a whole you know, community that you're a part of that you don't really sense 
you know, sitting at yeah. home or, you know, getting on your computer working on or on the phone working on your distribution. Yeah. And, you know, it's important to be in good film festivals, hopefully win some awards, you know, that mm -hmm. because that then that's going to help with getting distribution, too. Right. In, in terms of short documentaries, uh, I, I know you mentioned that could be a more challenging. I actually saw a couple of posts in some Facebook groups recently where um, people wrote, hey, I have a short documentary. I'm not sure what the best route is to distribute it. Do you have any advice or any thoughts on that, dis distributing a short documentary or even a short film in general? I wish I did. I mean, I made a narrative short a few years ago um, called House of Teeth, which is great. It's That won a bunch of awards. Yeah, it did. It did. Right? It did a lot yeah. of festivals, too. That's yeah. also available on Amazon. Cool. Um, it's 26 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I call it a comedy. I mean, it's funny. It's also very serious and moving and... Um, but, and I loved making it, and I, there are great performances in it. Um, that was, that's slightly easier to get distribution for. I mean, there, there's not that, there, there's, that was uh, picked up by Shorts TV, and um, I can't remember, there are a couple of, of um, Shorts channels that are mostly streaming um, that, gravitate I think towards narrative um, for short documentaries um, you know it's really it's really hard I can't yeah. believe Netflix doesn't just have a shorts channel people love watching yeah. short films it doesn't take that much time you know you come home you're tired you go you yeah. know I've got half an hour I want to see something meaningful and interesting but I don't want to sit here for a whole movie. Yeah. I mean, Netflix but, does have some. They, they had a <coughs> film um, uh, that we had screened in a festival some years back called um, uh, it, uh, Whatever Happens, I Love You, which actually uh, was either nominated or won an Academy Award. That was on Netflix. And they, they had some other ones. But I know what you mean. They don't have yeah. a section when you scroll through that says shorts. Yeah. You know, uh, and you're right. There, I think there are people that would really be into it, um, especially certain like genre type stuff. Like if they had a section called horror shorts. Like with Halloween yeah. coming up, I think people would be into Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on YouTube uh, as, as a distribution platform, especially for shorts? You know, I just don't know that much mm -hmm. about it. I'm I'm having a bit of a steep learning curve right now myself because I've, um, I've always had a producing partner. I don't pride myself on my producing skills. Mm -hmm. um, I've generally left that to my partner. Yeah. Um, she moved to another country. <laughs> um. So we're not, I mean, we're still really good friends, but we're not working together anymore. This is the first film I've produced my just solo. Um, so I'm, 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 and I'm, it's still on the festival circuit. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gearing up to really, you know, get in the weeds about how to really distribute it in the best way possible. So I'm not your best source for information right, right. on that. Yeah, there's so, I guess there's so many options now. Um, I know with Doc NYC coming up, they're going to have some panels on that as well. So um, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for, for documentary um, distribution now. Uh, but in terms of, you mentioned about producing, for uh, financing, uh, Obviously, that's one of the most difficult, you know, parts of getting a film made is getting oh, the financing. That's it. Yeah. Um, do you normally? What's some? What are some of the best strategies for for that? Is it pri uh, through private investors, Kickstarter campaigns. Um, do you have a? Any I mean, I've done to... them all. Um, yeah. I uh, out of my head was the uh, the most expensive documentary I've made, and that was a combination of of originally private donations from um, from donors who either who generally give to documentary films or we were able to find um, organizations that because it was a, a, a health issue, mm -hmm. we were able to find, you know, foundations and organizations that focused on that issue in particular. So that that can be useful. That was how we got started. But we didn't have enough money to keep going yeah we stopped and started stopped and started and then at one point we did a kickstarter campaign and it was fantastic i mean we we got almost we i think over 50 percent more than our goal in our allotted oh, wow. time that was all through 
uh, at once you were on Kickstarter, was that all through just promotion, your own social media pages? Yeah, and all e- your own emails and networks and friends. And I mean, it, it's it's a lot of work. A Kickstarter campaign is a lot of work. It was like basically a full-time job for two of us, plus we hired someone to help us. So there were three people who were, I mean, you have to pay attention every day to what's happening and the goals and what's coming in. And yeah. Because if you don't make your goal by your to- allotted time, you lose that everything you have to make your goal to get the money for from kickstarter there are other platforms that do it differently but that's great because it incentivizes you and the people who are participating to get make the goal make the goal because otherwise it all disappears so we we made our goal halfway through less than halfway through our time period and then we were able to almost double it um so yeah, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of networking. It's, you know, getting everybody to send it to everybody to send it to everybody. Right. Just fully utilizing your, your network. And there's yeah. a lot of great platforms. I mean, Kickstarter um, obviously is an incredible and wonderful platform. Indiegogo, which I believe, yeah. I, I still think you get the funds there, you even do. if you don't necessarily hit your goal. And then you have Seed and Spark, where uh, I think there's actually a distribution part of that as well, where once you get the film made, you can actually distribute it through them or something like that. I'm um, not sure. Yeah. I, I've never worked with them. But yeah, yeah, yeah there's a lot a lot of great opportunities, uh, no question about it. And yeah. so uh, now I just want to just um, touch upon your writing career as well. Now you've, as I mentioned earlier, you've written for some shows, you've written for Borgia on Netflix, you've written for um, 100 Center Street, mm-hmm. um, you know, you've had experience writing for series. Uh, for a lot of writers, that clearly would be a dream come true, I think, to get uh, you know an opportunity to, let's say, write for a Netflix series. Uh, how did you come across those opportunities? Was that all through mainly networking, just people you knew, or did you, do you have an agent? How did that all come about? So, um, gosh, that's there. I mean, every, each one came about differently, but in terms of getting started, um, I, I mean, I started out as a director. I wanted to direct narrative. Mm-hmm. And as happens with most people, if you, you know, it's it's a lot easier to, to write something sitting alone at home when nobody's paying you to do it than to yeah. direct something. So I think a lot of people start writing that way. Um, I, uh, the first... First, I'm trying to think. I I went to the American Film Institute, so I got my okay. first. I was a directing fellow there, and my. Are my, you from LA originally? No, I'm from here. I you went out. I'm there from New York. The, I went out there yeah. to to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that film that I wrote and directed. Um, oh wait, no, I didn't write that film. I forgot. It was an adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that got me an agent, and then I started writing my own stuff while I was, you know, as as in order to have a, a means to direct something that I cared about. Yeah. Um, and um, I ended up writing Shadrach with a writing partner who was I, a producer, and um, she raised the money. She had, as a producer in L.A., she knew, I mean, she was in L.A., I was in New York, but we... We, I had been, I stayed in LA for a while and we wrote the script together. But by the time I had moved back to New York, mm. by the time we got the money to, to make the film, um, it was, but it was Harvey Keitel yeah. who really got the film made. I mean, when Harvey agreed to be in it, so, then the money fell into place. So Harvey Keitel came on board first, then Andy McDowell. Yes. But yeah. when Andy came on, she at that point, she was the biggest female star in the world, actually. It was right after Four Weddings and a Funeral. Yeah. So when she came on, then we got even a little more money. Then the, the company gave us a little more money because we had two stars. Um, so then um, after that, my, okay, so that film was seen by Sidney Lumet, the great late director Sidney Lumet and he had just created this TV series 100 Center Street that was about to shoot start shooting and he what he saw Shadrach and he asked me to come to direct for 100 Center Street because he loved the work I had done on Shadrach Um, but what I had to do 
in order to do that, because I hadn't directed television, was to shadow Sydney for a whole season, which was fantastic. I was on set for a whole season. I ended up having an idea for a story because I got to know the, you know, the 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 characters and the situations so well. And Sydney said, "Okay, go ahead, write it," and I did, and he loved it. So I ended up. That was the first TV script I wrote um, for myself to direct, which I did for 100 Center Street. Um, then I had the great fortune of meeting Tom Fontana, who's you know one of the great TV writers, producers, showrunners. Um, that he's a he's a treasure and he's amazing. And I had an idea for a TV series, but I, I didn't know like how to make a TV series. So um, I asked if I could come talk to him about it, and I, I, and he said yes. And he loved the idea so much, he said, I want to do this with you. So we started working together. That was a show that, you know, we pitched. We almost got it made. It didn't, I mean, this, this is mostly what happens is that your ideas don't get made, and every once in a while they do. Then Tom went on to, to, to make Borgia, and he asked me to, um, to write some episodes of that. Wow, very cool. Um, but the, the, there, there was a point right after we did Shadrach where um, long-form TV movies were very popular. Right. Um, I know you'd written for Hallmark Hallmark as well. Hall of Fame, Lifetime, you know, yeah. those, they were doing like movies. They were doing movies for television. And um, so Bridget Terry, my writing partner, um, who had produced Shadrach and written it with me, um, she and I got a job writing, and actually a pretty, it was, it was a pretty great one for Hallmark, yeah. um, because it was based on an Ann Tyler novel um, called Back When We Were Grown Ups, and we had an incredible cast. It was... Blythe Danner, Faye Dunaway, Peter Fonda. I, I can't even remember who else was in it. Um, I didn't direct that. But um, so, you know, then we got hired for another one, and then we got hired by Lifetime and another one of those. So we were, we had a really good run with TV movies. And then that just kind of collapsed. You know, people stopped right. doing that very much. I mean, they still do it a bit, but. Yeah, I guess now, maybe now it's more for the streaming platforms, I suppose. Like yeah. The lifetime streaming platforms and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, yeah, they used to have these great TV movies that used to come out. Yeah. Right and that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and you work with some incredible people. Yeah, Tom Fontana, Sidney Lumet. I mean, that, that's uh, yeah. good. Did you I've read Sidney's book on, on screen? Oh, yeah, right? on directing. It's a classic, it's, right? Yeah. I also have taught directing and screenwriting for a really long time. Um at, and I, I always recommend, I, when I was teaching directing, I always recommended that book to my yeah. students. Yeah, it's always listed in like the top five, you know, books on filmmaking. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So uh, if, if how do you, I mean, if somebody wanted to get into writing now for like a series, do you think it's, a, it's different or maybe more difficult or easier now than maybe it was kind of when you were starting out? As far as I can tell, it's more difficult for two reasons. There are more people trying to do it, I think. Yeah. Um, but also, right now, the, the, the TV series world is contracting. It's not expanding. Yeah. It's getting tougher and tougher. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been, I've created um, a few series that have, not ultimately gotten made um a couple with tom some others not with him mm -hmm. um and, and i have another one i'm working on now but there's there's been a huge lull like every since the writers the, strike, yeah, the strike yeah which was successful and had a purpose and had to happen but it also um was an opportunity for the corporations who now kind of run the show mm. to you know weed things out and take a step back and slow things down because they had been over buying because there was that you know huge explosion of streaming right so it's hard i mean but do it i would never okay. say to somebody don't do it i think the thing to do if you want to be a television writer is just humble yourself and go in as low a level as you have to to um get 
some experience and make and and make contacts and have a network and you know if you have to be in the proverbial mail room or you know be an intern if there's a a company or you know or or a writer in particular who you like who hires people or who has you know a stable of interns just do it do anything you can to be surrounded by it, I mean, people can go in as script readers and do coverage, which is, you know, you do a synopsis of what the script is. Agencies have that. Film companies have that. Yeah, I've heard um, so many stories of writers who started out like that, just kind of interning. Um, I know people went through fellowship programs, started out as writer's assistants, writing coverage, yep, whatever it was, yep. just to kind of get into a writer's whatever room. Whatever it get takes. Started, you know? Yeah. And I also wanted to ask you a question about casting. I'm um, going back to Shadrach. Uh, how did you actually get Harvey Keitel on board because I know one of the things that filmmakers struggle with is how do I get how do you name get to talent you know how did you get the script to Harvey Keitel um, I had well I would I had an aide we ha- it, it was sent to him by our agents but you, they, that doesn't mean it's going to get to them. You know, there are, people have all these firewalls. So if you have any personal connection, you need to try it. So it turned out that I had a friend who was friends with the head of Harvey's company, development company. Okay. So she was like the gatekeeper, Peggy Gormley. Mm-hmm. So I sent it to her or, or we, we, I got my friend to sort of flag it to Peggy. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing is your work is going to stand on its own merit. But how do you get somebody to pay attention to it? First, yeah. somebody's got to read it to decide whether it's good or not, whether they want to do it or not. And that's the key to getting anything done is you just got to get eyes on it. Then if it's good enough, great. If it's not, I mean, there are plenty of good enough films and TV series that do not get made. I'm not just saying it's a meritocracy, mm-hmm. but you got to get somebody to see it. Yeah. Um, Peggy read it and loved it. I mean, she just loved it. And she loved it for Harvey. It was unlike anything he'd ever done before. And so she gave it to Harvey. And, I mean, this was long enough ago that um, <laughs> I didn't have a cell phone. I mean, I had an answering machine. Yeah. Um, and um, I... God, how did he track me down? I, I, I think Harvey called my answering machine was the first time I heard his voice. And then maybe I called back and left a message. Oh, I'm, I left a message because it was Mother's Day and I was going to Connecticut to see my mother. And I think I must have left my parents' number because he called me there. Oh. And that I remember being in my parents' house on Mother's Day <laughs> and talking to him and him saying, I love this and I want to do it. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. That's it incredible. doesn't happen that way anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, yeah, that was great. So then it was like, then it was a go. Then we had some issues with his agent who didn't really want him to do it because it wasn't a big enough film. So there's always that possibility. Right. So the agent was like, this is a first-time director, you know, this is a departure for Harvey, it's really low budget, he's not going to make enough money. And I happened to be friends with the another sadly deceased great, great director, Jonathan Demme. Oh, Jonathan Demme, great director. Yep. And we were talking about it. He had read the script and loved it. And... I told him I was having, I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to keep Harvey. And he said, well, would it help if I come on as executive producer? And I, you know, burst out laughing, would it help? Mm -hmm. Of course. So he called Harvey's agent and he said, I'll vouch for Susanna. I know she's a great filmmaker. We're going to do this. It'll be fine. And the agent said, well, I can't say no to Jonathan Demme. So Jonathan Mm -hmm. then, you know, tipped the balance and... right. And we made the film. Cool. Wow. All right. In, so in conclusion, um, if, you could, if you had one, I guess, piece of advice for aspiring filmmakers and or aspiring screenwriters, uh, what would it be? 
My advice would be don't compare yourself to everybody out there who you hear about all the time because you hear about them because they're having that small percentage of visible success that people have. You've got to keep believing in yourself, believing in your work, and putting it out there. And um, it's, it's tough. It's a really, really tough business. And it's, you, you got to love the process and the work itself and the creative outlet to make it work for yourself because you're not always going to be gratified by what you get back publicly and professionally. But, you know, if you can hang in there, it's so wonderful when you do get something made, when you when you are able to express yourself with that creativity. So, and no matter how many times you get knocked down, you get back up again and right. it makes yeah. you stronger. That's some great points. <laughs> yeah, definitely not comparing yourself to anyone else because that's not going to get you anywhere. No, it just, <laughs> it just, no, it's just, it sets you back. Right. It sets you back. Yes, and definitely, like you said, enjoying the process. I think a lot of yes. filmmakers uh, or whoever, are they, they love the end point or, you know, they love the idea of what happens at the end, the result. But you're right. You got to love yeah. the process. You got to love the journey. You know, that's yes. what keeps it exciting. Absolutely. Right? So, uh, all right. Thank you very much. Again, this is uh, uh, Susanna Styron. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, please check out Susanna's films. Um, she's screening My Father's Name at the upcoming Big Apple Film Festival, which takes place November 18th to December the 12th um, at Look, Dine, and Cinemas in New York City, as well as we have additional screenings in LA as well. Um, and also check out some of her earlier films, Shad Rock, um, which is currently streaming, uh, Out of My Head, which is also streaming as well, a great documentary um, distributed by Kino Lorber. And um, yeah, Susanna, thank you. you. Can I just say one thing? Yes, please. You can um, follow my father's name on so and any other a lot of other things of mine on social media at at hair on fire films and um we have a website for my father's name my father's name.com but if you want to look at the other my other work i, I have a website susanna styron.com so you can you know find links to shadrach and out of my head and all that great susanna styron.com um we have my father's name Dot com. Uh, dot com for the for the documentary and uh at hair on fire films at hair on fire films and also big media. apple is the new york premiere yeah all right big apple film festival is the is the uh the new york premiere yes all right very cool thank you so much Susanna. thank you and thank you all for watching